All right, well, we are on the last chapter. Locks mean nothing to ghosts, chapter 26. Derek, Rose, Clarence, the twins, Bullet, me, seven of us. Meg was considering coming, but at the last minute decided to stay back. You're just as good with that gun as I am, and Clarence and Bullet can track. I'm getting too old for this kind of thing. He settled in with my dad to annotate maps with new information, construction sites, the burnt out school. All right, I'll leave you old grandpas too at then, I sassed. The real warriors will take care of this. They chuckled as I sauntered away. I smiled, but it was fragile. I felt an acute pessimism at the back of my throat when they were together. How could anyone be so lucky as to have two fathers at this horrible time? Something had to give. Last chance, Meg. I'll give you a head start if you need it, I called over my shoulder. Nah, you go. There's no adventure left out there for me anymore. I'm done. We rolled out of camp within the hour. We didn't have much light left in the day and needed to find them before dark. Leaving it to the next day might mean we'd lose track of them, or worse, they'd discover us first. What was left of the day was gray and windy. Wind caused problems out here. With so much moisture in the air and loose dirt from both tectonic upheavals and the new species of flora tearing up the topsoil, it was like thin mud being thrown constantly in your face. I was glad for the bandanas we wore. Soon enough, we passed the place I'd found Rose waiting for me in the trees. I turned back now to watch her walking behind me, red printed fabric over her nose and mouth, a rifle slung on her slender back with a sling crafted from repurposed seat belts. She gave me a thumbs up and I returned the gesture. I hope we find an elder. Tree said just ahead. Someone who can help against the schools, Siguan finished. No one could replace Minerva. We'd be lying if we said finding someone like her wasn't on everybody's minds these days. Bullet slowed a bit so that we were walking in tandem. She was wearing three shades of denim and an old fedora over cropped hair. This is your first welcoming party. I nodded, even though it wasn't a question. We come in full aggression. She tapped on her top hat so that it tipped over lower on her brow, trying to keep the grip from her good eye. What if there are children in the camp? What if they're friendlies? And what if they're not? She turned to me slightly. Better to apologize later than have to bury a friend or worse. There's something worse than that? Yeah, not being able to bury them. She tilted her, she tilted her head forward and picked up her pace, passing in front once more. Riri's face flashed in front of my eyes. I took a misstep and stumbled over a root, my rifle sliding to my side. I caught it in my hand and readjusted the black paisley swatch over my face. You couldn't let wounds take your focus out here. Soon we were crouched in a line behind a cluster of rock, taking stock of the newcomers. Four tents, military-style A-frames. A small fire with a metal grate slid over top where they were cooking beans in a tin pot. One camper was washing up an old red mop bucket with a crack down the side. He wore his hair in a floppy mullet style through, the, the, through with silver. Something about his eyes reminded me of Minerva, and I wondered if they were related. My stomach pinched up. Two black women sat stirring the beans and talking about a shared memory from back in the city, about a play where the main actor had been too drunk to recite his lines. With their loose sentence structure and the melodic give and take allowing a team approach to conversation, I knew they were Guyanese. After the weather got violent and the islands were battered, the West Indian population here had swollen. They laughed together, and I grew nostalgic for my old life. There were two other campers standing by one of the tents, and it, and it was them if I'm honest, that made it easier for us to build aggression before we stormed in. They were having what appeared to be a casual conversation with a relaxed ease about their posture. Neither one of them was armed and just one had a towel wrapped around his head like a turban having just finished bathing, but it was their paleness that set us on edge. One man had long blonde hair loose across his shoulders. The second in the turban had his shirt off and he was pale except where his sleeves would have ended and the skin was burnt pink, but no old people. What to make of this diverse group? We hesitated, swinging between opt optimism and immediate hate. I wished Meg had come. He'd always, he always knew what to do. And even when he didn't, he could tell us which one of us would have the pitch perfect instinct for that moment to advise. It was Derek who made the call, getting to his feet, pulling his bandana high over the bridge of his nose, stuffing his braid into the back of his shirt. Break, let's just go. Daylight's fading fast. For once, I agreed with him. We slid from behind the rocks and cut through the trees like moving water, crashing over the camp in ones and twos. I grabbed the mullet guy, who was startled but put up no fight. Let's go, over to the fire, on your knees. The women were already on the ground, beans boiling over unattended. They held hands while they lay on their stomachs, bullets standing over them with a crossbow. Just relax right there, ladies. Relax and I won't be forced to use this. 
Derek had the long-haired blonde man by the back of the neck. He steered him over to the fire and pushed him down hard into the mud near the mullet, who had settled back onto his considerable ass by this point. Jeez, man, watch out, okay? I'm not arguing with you. Shut it. Derek's eyes were hostile over the horizon of fabric. He pushed the muzzle of his gun into the man's spine, sending him sprawling on his stomach. Dude, all right, I'm just going to stay here, just like this. The man raised his hands above his head and folded them there, seeking reprieve. Boy, Axiom. Clarence had the other man with the pink arms, hands behind his back, walking over to the group. Enough now. We, uh, have to assess first. He tried to cover up his careless Cree with English. We worked hard to disguise ourselves, especially our indigeneity, around newcomers. Asked him. The man turned his head back towards his captor, eyes wide, mouth opening to speak again. It was unlike Clarence to be violent, so what happened next was more about his embarrassment over the slip-up than his true nature. Never mind you, he growled, grabbing the man's shoulder and jerking him so violently his towel was knocked off and, sh and a shock of dark hair fell over his face. He fell onto one knee in the scuffle, landing hard. Ow, Jesus, he hissed. Rose stamped her foot on the damp ground. I can't do this. She helped him to his feet and brought him over to the fire so he could pick rocks out of his bloody knee. He nodded his head at her. Hiena, Hiena asikomitan. Clarence and Derek exchanged a look. Rose helped the woman up next, sitting everyone in a row, one beside the other. Are you from the schools? One of the women asked. Are you? Bullet answered with a question. Us? Oh, God, no, she scoffed. We're helping to keep people from the damn schools. Bullet looked over at the mullet, who was sitting up against the tree trunk, cleaning his nails with a sharp stick. And how exactly are you doing that? The woman explained they had been nurses at the Sudbury Hospital and saw the treatments in volunteer studies firsthand. They talked about their first mission, taking children, a brother and sister, out of the program and secreting them away through a series of friends and allies. In the meantime, Clarence had lowered himself to a crouch and was in low conversation with the, thir with the shirtless man who'd think Rose didn't Cree. He couldn't help himself. Clarence was a curator of Cree. He loved his language the way Minerva had loved us, with pride and enthusiasm of old potential repurposed. We stood in silence for a few minutes, weapons still pointed at our prisoners. We waited for Clarence or Bullet to tell us what came next, if we were taking them back or leaving them here, or I didn't want to think about any other alternative. Derek, Tree, Ziguan, keep an eye on our guests, Clarence spoke up. He called them guests, so that was a good sign, and he was using our real names out loud too. The knot of anxiety between my shoulders slackened. Rose, French, bullet, a word please. We walked away from the fire pit, over behind the tents. Clarence was peering into each one as we passed, looking for missed bodies or weapons. We stood in a tight circle. I could tell by her face bullet was annoyed with our gentle handedness. What do we need to talk about? We'll serve them for a bedtime snack? Clarence waved off her sarcasm. The shirtless one, one of the two pale men, he's Cree. Are you certain? It's not all that difficult for a recruiter to learn one of our languages. He could have just started speaking it when he heard you use it first. Well, it was sharp. Clarence sighed, kicking a rock by his foot. I know, that's on me, but I am certain. He's speaking an old Cree I don't even fully know. He's way more fluent than me or anyone else I've met. And I've walked his lineage back. What about the others? There's only one native in the bunch besides this Cree in disguise. Bullet was still skeptical. They're allies, real allies. They put their lives on the line. It's not just talk. You heard them, Clarence insisted. There may be... Wait, Rose cut him off. Is he as fluent as Minerva was? I saw right away where she was headed, so I stated the obvious. But he's not old. I mean, not elder kind of old. Why does he have to be old? She was excited now. I could see it flashing in her dark eyes like the clouds of fireflies that made summer nights frantic with light. The key doesn't have to be old. The language already is. We stood there for a minute, the wrinkles in Bullet's forehead smoothed out like a sheet pulled tight. Clarence, I said, I need to ask him something, then we'll know. He nodded back to the fire, grabbing a red checkered shirt from a low branch by the next last tent. The twins were standing over the nurses and Nish, their guns pointed towards the ground. Derek was watching the two men. He kept his rifle trained on the small space between their heads. I put my hand on his shoulder and squeezed, letting him know I had this. I threw the shirt to the man Clarence had spoken to. He nodded gratitude and pulled it on, buttoning the front over his damp skin. How do you dream? He looked up, and it wasn't so hard to see his nation there. It was there in his light eyes, the way they angled down and avoided roundness just slightly. It was in the right corners of his high cheeks and the smooth flatness of his lips. It was there in the question he posed back with just the movement of his eyebrows. I mean, what does it sound like? Come again? I sighed. I hoped he wasn't in a mood to stall. 
What language do you dream in? He smiled and his lips parted to show rows of bright teeth. I already knew what he was gonna say. Nehawayak, big man. I watched the word leave his mouth. I felt it fall over my face through the cotton damp with breath and mud. It raised the skin on my arms to bump. I dream in Cree. I looked back over to the small council and nodded, smiling. Pack him up, Clarence called out. We were getting close now, passing the log once more. I slowed down, hoping to walk with Rose the remainder of the trip. Instead, I ended up beside the Cree. He smiled, so I tried to make small talk now that we were able to tuck our aggressive bravado away. Even Bullet had softened, smiling at the back of the line while the nurses laughed and teased each other. So how long have you been in the bush? Oh, years. Too long. Were you always with these people? I've been with Talia and Helene, the nurses, since the beginning. They're the ones who helped get me out of the school. I was brought into their hospital for blood work to determine my eligibility. And, well, here we are. He put air quotes around eligibility. What do you mean, eligibility? He pushed air out of his nose and smiled and, a, and smiled full of bitterness to make sure my blood wasn't too mixed. Can't catch a break for being a half-breed any way you look at it. I stayed silent. My family didn't really have those problems. No one mistook us for anything other than what we were. I wondered if we were lucky or not. My family, my stolen family. How did you stay alive in there? My voice betrayed the small sliver of hope sliding under my skin. I heard it's pretty grim. I had somewhere I needed to be. He pushed back the hair from his forehead, someone I needed to be with. And that's when I saw it, the dark lines curving from his middle knuckle round the ridges of a vein, settling just under the cuff of his plaid sleeve, a tattoo of a buffalo on the back of his hand. Isaac? His eyes grew wide. He dropped his hair so that it swung back into his face and his feet slowed. How do you know my name? That bundle I carried in my chest, the one that inflated when I heard about our triumphs, the one that ached with our losses, the same place where my love for Rose nested and the painful memories were enshrined and mourned. From there came the push. I set off running. Hey, French. Hey, what's the matter? Tree yelled after me. I couldn't answer. I had to get to Mig now. The moon was hoisted to the center of the sky as I ran, a big stage spotlight among the smaller bulbs of, star bulbs of stars. It illuminated the green expanse between trees and the rocky outcroppings that marked the start of our camp. The grass here was waist high with clusters of sleepy blooms nodding their heavy heads in the blue light. I ran into the clearing, pulled out my breath in to yell. It burned all the way down my throat into my belly. Migwans! A crow, startled by my small commotion, alighted from a branch to the right, cawing his displeasure, a staccato of anxiety stitching the night a darker blue. A short silence was followed by the quick shuffle of feet, of bouncing strobes of flashlights and hands. A small group came into view from the denser pines by the rock. I bent in two, hands on knees, gasping for the air to call Mig to me, to us. Mig wands! The group spoke low amongst themselves, and then there was movement. I raised a hand to block out the glare and saw Mig pushing through the bodies to the front of the group. French? I laughed out the next ragged breath. I didn't know I was crying until I closed my eyes and the water dropped onto my cheeks, hitting the back of my hands. He took a step towards me, then stopped and saw his flashlight into the trees. There was crashing behind me as the others caught up. I turned my head, still bent over to catch my breath, expecting Derek's or quick bullet, but it was him. It was Isaac at the head of the party. He slowed to a walk now, the welcoming party and newcomers falling in behind. He slowed all his movements, as if focusing his eyes and reconciling what they saw took motion from his muscles. I heard a sound like an echo turn inside out, and then Meg, who had been standing still, trying to see, to understand, under the blue smoke of moonlight, finally took a step forward. Meg ones? Is that you? Isaac's words jumped up his throat like heartbeats, each book ended with a pause, then settling in the gr grass like blood coagulating. We couldn't move for it. I couldn't breathe. Meg opened his mouth. The movement unhinged his legs and he fell to his knees, knocking down the grass like so much chaff. He held his hands out, palms turning upward in a slow ballet of bone marrow, intact after all this time, under the crooked sky against the broken ground. Isaac? I heard it in his voice as Migwans began to weep. I watched it in the steps that pulled Isaac, the man who dreamed in Cree, home to his love, the love who'd carried him against the rib and breath and heard of his chest as ceremony in the glass vial. And I understood that as long as there are dreamers left, there will never be want for a dream. And I understood just what we would do for each other, just what we would do for the ebb and pull of the dream, the bigger dream that held us all, anything, everything. And that is the end of the book. <laughs>